Well, good evening, everybody. I, I've been asked just to do the uh, quick welcome this evening uh, to Swansea. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rob Stewart. I'm the leader of Swansea Council, uh, also the chair of the Swansea Bay City Region and uh, Welsh Local Government Deputy Leader. So I've got many hats on this evening, but obviously a um, big proponent uh, of Swansea. Welcome uh, to all of you here for this uh, great event, uh, especially uh, a warm welcome to, to the Minister, uh, Vaughan Gethin, who's here this evening and, and will be speaking shortly. Um, I just wanted to start by saying, look, I think this evening it is about the opportunity for us to talk about um, how uh, the Welsh economy and the UK economy can uh, move forward. Um, and I think the theme for this evening is not about reinventing the wheel, but looking at those things that we're really good at uh, and how we can maximise those opportunities for places like Swansea. And uh, you'll know that uh, if you've been paying uh, attention to our city deal proposals, then that's exactly the, uh, the approach we've been taking here, which is about looking at what we're really good at, what, we, what is unique about this region and this city, and what we need as specific interventions to grow the economy, to fix the, the underlying weaknesses in our economy, and to make sure that we're a success. And um, you know, so pleased to see you this evening. We've even laid on a fun fair for you to, to participate in <laughs> afterwards. Um, but no, more seriously, look, really proud uh, that we have a, a really uh, fantastic story uh, unraveling in Swansea in terms of investment development. There's over a billion pounds worth of live and pipeline developments uh, taking place in the city. We've signed a strategic partnership with Urban Splash to develop um, seven key strategic sites across the city. And, you know, uh, even now, uh, we've got lots of development, but in the coming years, again, uh, we will see even more. But really interested in, in your views this evening in terms of what we can do to add to that and, you know, how we can make sure that we maximise the opportunities for places like Swansea. So, thank you very much for coming. Um, I really hope you have a great evening. Unfortunately, I can't stay with you for the whole event because I'm do up at the Swansea.com stadium. I'm not allowed to call it Liberty anymore. I get fined. Um, <laughs> but the Swansea.com stadium, obviously the home of the best football team in Wales. Um, thank you, Vaughan. Uh, and uh, uh, I look forward to a great evening and welcome all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction. Uh, evening, everybody. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation. For those of you who don't know, then you've done quite well to come to the event. But if you don't know, we're a small economics research uh, charity focused on raising the living standards of those on low and middle incomes. So that's all I want to say thank you very much all for coming. It's cold, it is dark, it's wet, although not as wet as it was earlier. The, um, uh, and you gave up the opportunity to go on the Ferris wheel on the way through, uh, which is quite, and it's a late night tomorrow. Midnight finish? No, 11.30? So you've kind of a pretty impressive turning up at all, basically. <laughs> anyway, you made the right decision, obviously, is our view. So what do you get for making the right decision? Well, um, probably, I don't know, if anyone wants to demure, they can, but probably nobody thinks things are going that well economically uh, right now. We are looking at income falls of 7% over the course of this year and next, um, driven obviously mainly by high energy costs. That's the equivalent of £1,700 per household. So we, everyone knows if you didn't already feel like a really tough time, then what is coming over the next year certainly does, and then that's before we start to see what looks like a rise in unemployment next year and before the rise in mortgage bills turns out from being something on a Bank of England chart into being something in people's bank accounts. So it's a difficult today that people are dealing with. And one of the things I think that makes it so difficult, makes it difficult for everybody, but actually makes it particularly difficult for those people interested in economic policy or working in it, I can see some people at the back, uh, who've made that lifestyle error. If you've made those choices, then one of the things that makes it really difficult at the moment is that you difficult today is matched by not having a clear sight of a better tomorrow. And I think that is one of the things that is particularly different maybe about um, uh, the UK today compared to other phases where we've had difficult um, circumstances. Now, given all that, one of the reasons we're here today is to talk about the Economy 2030 Inquiry, which is a big joint project between ourselves at the Resolution Foundation and the London School of Economics, briefly funded by the Nuffield Foundation, I should say. And it's focused on what how do you get back that future? How do you get back as clear a sense of where we're trying to get to that is a better tomorrow? And obviously that's done at all kinds of different levels, but a real economic strategy for the UK, I think it's hard to argue that anyone thinks we have right now. Now, and the strategy isn't about utopias. There's lots of politicians who have talked about 
uh, utopias, be those very low tax or um, uh, a kind of very large spending long list of utopias from another part of the political spectrum in the recent past. But this is not, that's not a useful thing. Instead, a real strategy is about a plausible route for a country as it exists in the here and now to a better future, and particularly a future with higher growth and lower inequalities. I'll judge, although other people would choose different objectives, but those would be the two that we would highlight. Now, our work is focused UK-wide, although we try to dig in as often as possible into what it, how that differs across different parts of the country. But obviously, uh, the economy isn't lived at that level for most people, most of the time. Some people spend their life traveling around the country, but there aren't that many, and there's less than there used to be. Um, actually, people work and live in specific places, economic strategies are play out in actual places, and those places have different comparative advantages, they have different kinds of sectors, people in them want different kinds of things. So we're now a year into this project, there's a year to go. Having done our diagnosis of what the UK challenges are and what a plausible strategy looks like, we're now spending most of our time these days around the country listening to other people about what they think about that, about what it could mean for them, bits of it that don't sound like they would work in some areas, or the, and sometimes us playing back some challenges about whether lots of different parts of the country do have a clear economic strategy that will deliver on what everybody hopes. So that is what tonight is uh, part of. So hopefully we will hear from, learn from the panel, and then hopefully learn from all of you over the course of the evening. So to help us do that, first of all, you're going to hear from Christian Shah, who's an economist at the Resolution Foundation, and he's going to give you a brief. I'm not sure how, how many slides are you down to. Is it brief, Christian? 20 slides, come on, quick. Right, so some brief slides that are summarising a very long book, which you can get a free copy of at the back if you haven't already. The, um, uh, those of you that thought you might get charged if you picked it up, you can pick it up, people. It's fine. Uh, so go a free book if you, if you don't get the full summary from the slides. Uh, and then I'm very glad we're going to hear from Vaughan Gethin, who's obviously the Welsh Minister for the Economy, and I've really enjoyed all of our interactions over the years. With the, um, and he's also just got back from having a jolly, having a very serious economic trip to Washington. <laughs> They're watching great football games and the rest. So he's going to give us a response um, to that. And then you're going to hear from uh, Professor Melanie Jones, who's a professor of economics at Cardiff uh, Business School since 2015. So quite a long time now. And she's also from Swansea. So she's a winner from the location of the event uh, tonight. So you're going to hear from her. And then we're going to open for uh, discussion. And then there's some more drinks. That is the plan. OK? Good. Right, Christian, you can kick us off. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, like Torsten said, it's my job to try and summarise this 150-page book uh, into 12 minutes. Um, and so hopefully you all learn something and this will go very smoothly. Um, so, I'm going to begin by setting the scene. So, in 2022, we face an immediate challenge, and that is of inflation. Inflation has now reached 11.1%, um, and this was largely unexpected from previous forecasts. And what this has mainly been driven by is energy bills, with the conflict in Ukraine leading to an increase in gas prices. So we've seen energy bills increase by seven times relative to their pre-pandemic prices. And in the medium term, the OBR forecast them to remain around 4%. So this, this fall off inflation in the medium term doesn't mean that the prices are, are coming down significantly. We're still being faced by um, increased prices for energy. And what this leaves the government and policymakers with um, a decision about is how this pain of um, becoming a poorer country as a result of these increases in energy prices, how this is redistributed across um, the economy and across different households. But what we can't get away from is that it's going to result in huge falls in income this year and next. As Torsten mentioned, real disposable incomes are expected to decline by 7.1% and that's around £1,700 per household. But while the short-term cost of living crisis growing into a medium-term cost of living crisis is the problem facing policymakers today, it's important to remember that it's come off the back of 15 years of relative economic decline. And what the next decade needs to be about is building a strategy to rebuild the UK's economy and not simply firefighting without thinking about what this might mean for the future. So the first of these problems that the UK economy faces began in the 80s, and that's the, the creation of incredibly high inequality um, amongst individuals. So this chart shows you the Gini coefficient, which is one measure of, um, of income inequality, and looks at how this has changed over time. And you can see a great increase in the 1980s, and a sort of plateau throughout the 90s to the point we are today. 
So this is something we've inherited from the past, and, and while it, it may seem surprising to see something, uh, inequality remain so flat in this measure um, over the last 20 years, it's clear that, that this um, is a significant problem that an economic strategy needs to, to solve. The second issue has been the rise of, um, well, the decline of UK economic growth. In this chart, we show three different um, important factors that, ex that show how strong and how well an economy is performing. So a productivity measure of GDP per capita, um, wages, which uh, is just the earnings that people get from the work they do, and then disposable income, which those, wa those wages and transfers between people as a result of taxes and benefits, and what that ends up being in their pockets at the end of the day. And what you can see here is that weak productivity um, has, has really affected the UK economy over the past 20 years. So instead of seeing something like 30% increases in the productivity um, of, this, of our economy over 10 years, this has moved almost to, to nothing. And the concomitant fall in wages and incomes that have come with that have placed significant burdens on UK households. So what this toxic combination of high inequality and low growth means is that relative to many European countries, um, the UK isn't performing as well as it once was. What this chart shows you is the, uh, the level of incomes at different points in the distribution in the UK relative to other countries. So what the big takeaway is, is that while um, the top of UK households, the richest 10%, are, are slightly richer than their French counterparts, but slightly poorer than their German counterparts. The bottom and the middle have seen um, big declines in their relative spending powers. So from this chart, we can see that the UK is effectively 22% poorer than France, and that, that amounts uh, to 3,800 pounds a year for, for the poorest households. So these are significant issues. And what this means is that when we're faced with um, big shocks to the price of, um, the price of essentials, so here we're looking at food, fuel, clothing and transport, that more and more people are seeing larger amounts of their income completely, um, large amounts of their income taken up by spending on essentials. So in the poorest quintile you can see that back in 2006 they were spending just under 52% of their income on essentials and by 2019 this has grown to around 59%. So this means that, that households and the poorest households in particular struggle to um, to, to absorb shocks and lack the economic resilience that might be needed to maintain living standards in difficult times. So what can we do to sort of turn around this decline of the last 20 years or so? And what we say in, in our work is that the main thing that Britain needs to do is get serious both about growth and about delivering growth and about trying to solve this inequality problem to ensure more even distribution of income um, between households. But the first step of getting serious about growth and delivering growth in the UK is getting serious about where our strengths lie and accepting them. So this chart looks at um, the extent to which different economies are specialised in services. So you, the, the countries on the far left are those that, that produce and export more goods than services, and the countries on the right are those that produce more services. And what you can see from the UK's position is that we are a service superpower. The UK is the second largest exporter of services, um, and it exports around 418 billion of, this, um, of these every year. And from the width of these bars, we can see that we're also the only economy of comparable size which is so specialised in services. And this isn't all about financial services and associated business services. This is also strengths in um, in creative industries um, and in other sort of businesses like architecture um, and other regulated services. So it's important that we sort of understand that the strengths that we need to build on are those, are those based in these services industries and simply trying to become a manufacturing superpower isn't something that's necessarily what we can do. But accepting these also means that we are sort of led to think more carefully about what our strategy is um, when it comes to improving the lot of our economy. Services benefit from an agglomeration effect. This means that companies and firms become more productive as a result of co-locating regionally. So we can see this from by comparing the UK 
um, this geographical spread of our productivity with France. And what you can see by the size of the bubbles is that, the, that London and Paris and France and the UK are both this high productivity, large centres of activity. And that's simply as a result of our services um, tilt. But what we can also see is that the gap between the second cities in France is a lot smaller than it is in the UK. So the gap between Lyon and Paris is around 20% in productivity terms, but the gap between Manchester and London is 30%. And so what this leads us to, to realise is that part of improving and delivering a strategy for growth is delivering and improving the performance of our second cities. But doing that requires significant investment and significant change. In, here, in this chart, we're showing a thought, thought experiment of what it would take to close the productivity gap between London and Cardiff to 20%. And what this amounts to is 30% more capital per worker, 30% more highly, edu highly educated graduates in Cardiff, and a 30% bigger workforce who can benefit from these agglomeration effects. And that 150,000 increase in Cardiff is almost like half of Swansea moving uh, to Cardiff for work. So these are big changes. But as well as focusing on the changes that we want to happen, we also think about, we also need to think about the changes which matter uh, on the downside for, for the UK. And this chart shows you some modelling that we've undertaken as part of this project, looking at the long-term effects of, of the Brexit, um, the Brexit deal um, on the UK and on real wages. And what this shows is that the impacts are most severe in, the, in Wales, the North East and London, with around 2%, um, with around 2 uh, smaller real wages as a result of this deal. So what we need to be thinking about is how we mitigate uh, the bad impacts of some of the changes that are coming in the next decade. But as well as growth, we need to think more seriously about inequality. And thinking more seriously about inequality means that we should be thinking about the interventions we can make in the labour market. This is going to take far more than simple changes to the tax system or promoting ESG within corporations. What this will mean is um, improving worker power. It will mean ensuring that workers have good conditions in which to work in, have more control over uh, the way they work. And it also means creating a bedrock of good jobs um, benefiting from some of the changes in industries as a result of um, decarbonisation and also thinking more carefully about how we um, improve the lot of people working in non-tradable sectors such as care which take up around 60% of employment and these given that they are non-tradable are things that we can really help improve through um, policy alone. It also means that we need to make sure that some of the changes that are coming as a result of net zero, for example, don't leave the poor behind. What this chart shows um, is the, the big increases in energy efficiency installations that are going to be required over the coming 20 years to deliver a net zero by 2050. And while there will be a lot of activity in the coming decade, um, it's important to remember that lots of this energy efficiency will require upfront investment, and there's a risk that the poorest are left behind. The poorest fifth of homeowners have, around, have a disposable income of around £9,000 and on average these, the costs that they will incur in trying to improve uh, the energy efficiency of their homes will completely uh, take all of this, so around £8,600. So we need to make sure that those who can take the opportunities available by, uh, by making their houses more energy efficient are not simply the rich. Secondly, we need to be ensuring that our public services continue to be funded. Um, and what we've seen as a result of stagnation is that um, the tax take to GDP ratio has been climbing, but we haven't been rewarded with um, better public services. And part of doing so is making sure that the tax system is able to get the resources to public services. And it's important that, therefore, we don't just think about lowering taxes, but we also think about where taxes fall on the population. Now, this chart shows you how wealth has changed over time um, compared to how taxes, taxes on wealth or wealth-related items have changed over time. And what you can see is while, um, sort of GDP, while wealth has grown to eight times the size of GDP, the tax take from wealth 
has barely changed in almost 60 years. So we need to do better and work out how we get more um, in tax take from more sources um, rather than simply lowering headline rates. And we should also think about um, how we build security into our labour market. So with the coming change um, of the 2020s in the form of net zero Brexit um, and reshaping of our economy more generally, we're going to see some um, redeployment of labour, some workers moving from industry to industry. And what we note is that the UK's um, social security system doesn't provide nearly the same amount of protection as the systems in many of, of our peer countries. So what you can see here is that the UK's um, unemployment benefits for a single person without children barely covers 40% of the wage that, you'd, that the average person would be on in this country. And so if we're going to try and um, reshape and redeploy the resources in our economy, it's important that people who are expected to move um, and who will be changing jobs are not left in destitution as a result of that. So what is the prize on offer if we do all these things and manage to tackle our stagnation and deliver a new strategy for the UK? Well, basically, the gains that are to be had can completely reshape our society. This chart shows you the prize on offer. On, on the far left, um, we can see the impact of raising the UK's income levels to match five comparator countries, and these are Germany, the Netherlands, France, Canada, and Australia, countries that we'd normally consider our peers. But if we were simply to be as rich as them, we would see an across-the-board increase in our incomes of 20%. If instead we were just to become as unequal as them, so we were to reduce inequality to the levels of these five comparator countries, we can see that the rich would lose some of their income, but the poorest would gain 20%, which would make a significant impact on their ability to absorb shocks. But if we did both of these things, what we can see is huge gains at the bottom of around 45% of incomes, but also small gains for the top as well, helping create a more prosperous um, and equal society. So to summarise, the current cost of living crisis should prompt us how to think about should prompt us to think more carefully about the last two decades of stagnation and how that's impacted households. Revitalising our UK economy should be based on creating a strategy rather than wishful thinking, and we should be trying to spread the gains from higher growth across regions with significant investment and also across individuals by trying to reduce our already high levels of inequality. And the price for doing this and controlling inequality and boosting growth, growth is potentially huge. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Christian. Thank you very much. Um, so, growth up, inequality down, that is the task. How are we going to get it? Over to you. Well, Jolt, when I speak to our panel, it's a pleasure to be here seeing uh, some new faces, some old friends and Dave Hagenbeck, who's still in recovery in the audience. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be with you. Thank you both to uh, Rob Stewart uh, for giving an open hatch. I think Swansea has got a real level of ambition and lots uh, in progress already compared to, say, a decade ago. And that does show that active leadership at a local level can make a difference. But also thank you to Torsten, who I'm delighted uh, is here following his recent spat with Stephen Bush online about how youthful looking he does it as a look. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Torsten shaved his beard, so that's why he looks especially useful uh, tonight. But I would like Christian for the uh, presentation, the overview. And it's quite interesting following on to change some of the parts of what I was going to say based on the presentation. Uh, but also thank, of course, to the Waterfront Museum for hosting us here tonight. And the location is fitting in many ways, as you'll have seen from a range of exhibitors. Families, school children, and tourists visit this building to learn about how Swansea and Wales have helped to shape and been shaped by dramatic economic change since the Industrial Revolution. My son has been learning in school about the Victorians and he's um, quite pleased not to be a child of Victorian Britain for a number of reasons. Uh, but when you come here today to consider what comes next for us and what we could do to help shape it, and of course a number of the points that Christians made um, set out significant challenges across the UK. Not all of those leaders are here in Wales with the Welsh Government. But I think it should still be about what can we do, and in particular, given that there is 
uh, some flux in the nature of relationships and potentially for the future as well. I saw the uh, not just the stagnation nation report, but Labour's recently published draft industrial strategy recognised there was a need to reconsider how devolution works in the UK. Uh, rates of reach are something similar about Northern England, but of course when you look at successful states, uh, lots of those successful state actors have significant devolution. Germany being perhaps the easiest, most obvious example within the European context, but it's not unusual to have uh, different powers held in the centre and those within nations and regions that make up the unitary state. Uh, I'm particularly pleased that the residents of our nation are here. Uh, of course, for the interest in and contribution of the policy of making wells in the past, but also hopefully a continuing interest in that. Uh, and some of the debates we have here on impact of UK choices, but choices we can make as well. And obviously, the foundation, despite being young and small, as Thompson has said, uh, but still having a major impact on the UK's economic debates, including for those of you that don't watch Channel 4 News. Uh, but I, I think that's particularly so because of the deliberate focus the foundation has on living standards. Uh, and that's especially important for us in Wales. Torsten was um, pointing out to me that um, equality rates in Wales are better than the UK. Well, that is actually because we don't have as many people in the higher income brackets. Uh, we disproportionately have more people in the low and middle income range. It's one of the challenges and the puzzles for us in the government on whether we actually use our income rates any better. Because we have to essentially <coughs> raise money from lots of people on lower and middle incomes to make a significant difference in raising, uh, in raising money. And that brings its own practical challenges, whether you're in a period of early recession or not. Now, it's true enough, I think, when we think about not just our long-term strategy, but the role for experts, uh, as opposed to some of the quasi think tanks in Tufton Street and others, and we saw their recent move into Downing Street for a brief period of time and the impact that had. But you have to work for the trust, you know, we found that within the government. And there's a rigour and analysis that I think is needed now more than ever. And the Stagnation Nation report um, that I had the opportunity to read some of on the plane on the way to Washington for my serious work visit it went very well, pointing out the parts of the outward looking uh, nation we have and also opportunities for growth. Uh, that looked at the performance of the UK economy and not just the, and the question of how and where decisions should be taken. So I'd like to talk a bit more about the levelling up story as we have it today and what that's meant for Wales. And there are also, hopefully, uh, some more hopeful and positive thoughts on the future. Now, again, Christian's presentation talks about some of the complex challenges that we face and some of the trade-offs and potential uh, solutions on offer. However, when you look at the levelling up white paper, I don't think it bears much relation to the picture that Christian's painted, both of our current economic prospects, the picture of inequality, but also answers for the future. The Levinick White Paper recognises that significant in inequality exists across the UK, uh, but then the answers I don't think really set out to match the challenge. The rhetoric and the reality have been divorced. And I don't think that White Paper has a serious focus on areas of comparative advantage, so I don't think it's relevant to the job of making the UK more competitive. We saw Christian's perspective on service, I'll talk a bit more about that later on. And it doesn't really focus on targeting need. I mean, it isn't really geared up to lift people out of poverty. And the points made in the presentation and previously about inequality is worse in the UK than in comparable states. The UK and the US really stand out in that sense of wealthier nations with significant inequality. Uh, and even despite that, I think the technical phrase that Torsten had used previously to describe um, the fact that we're actually less wealthy than comparable nations was, I think it was that these other nations are way richer than the UK. I think that's a technical uh, economist term for it. But it's true, you look at the figures, and we have a big challenge of overall output. In having more people with more in a more unequal society, it doesn't mean that our overall picture is a country that is wealthier. And perhaps worst of all, there wasn't any sense of partnership or cooperation in the learning of white papers answer. So the project is not informed by priorities that are understood by communities, businesses and policymakers across the UK. It was actually pretty centrally driven mission that then says local areas will now deliver against the plan that we have put together. Now, in crude terms, levelling up in practice has meant that Wales has less say over less money. 
and we've tried to run through some of the arguments for this, it's just a matter of fact. The way the Levin budgets worked is that the promises on people not losing a penny haven't been made real, but also the way the money is then distributed. If you look at the formula for levelling up in Wales, it actively takes money away from areas with concentrated uh, poverty and inequality and spreads them out and levels them off into areas that have less of an economic challenge. Now that's good news for some parts where they're getting more money, but it's at the expense of communities with the biggest challenge to meet. For more than 20 years before that, decisions about uh, structural funds were spent and they were taken in devolved areas by this devolved government. Um, and the choice was made to move away from that, not in the manifesto, but in the way that that was designed. Now that causes a real sense of grievance uh, about what's happening, but it also means you've now got choices being made in areas that are plainly devolved by competing areas of influence. So far from having a clearer picture of who will make choices, at what level, on our subject, and now the picture is much more confused with money that's being promised to transform the country in headline terms, but in reality it's being spent in a more disparate way. And I think sometimes this can be a bit boring. Why would you talk about the funding formula um, unless you're talking about that speech in Tunbridge Wells? Well, actually, the funding formula matters because it shows not just a level of commitment and understanding of the challenge, but it also helps you to understand how much resource you've got to try and do something together. Um, it also matters when, when you talk about um, the nature of how the money is organised. Because the more people you have time to argue with it, and the mission they've been set in levelling up terms is much more disparate. So it's not bigger strategic challenges they're looking to resolve. Uh, and so I think we're going to go through some of the things that I think we learned here in Wales in the first round of structural funds. We probably spent money too narrowly on projects that were too small. Uh, I know there's a former finance minister in the room, and we then try to learn some of those lessons, try to look to spend money on more strategic projects to make a bigger difference. And whilst we managed those funds, unemployment fell more rapidly in Wales compared to the rest of the UK, reversing an historic trend. Our challenge is we still need to do even more to catch up. We also have growth in employment and qualification levels and decreases in economic inactivity in West Wales and the Valleys. And again, our challenge is we still haven't caught up, we still have more to do. The risk we face now is going backwards in those areas. EU funding also supported the Development Bank of Wales and our business support service, Business Wales, apprenticeship programmes and wider employability and skills support, including the Wales Union Learning Fund, who we're visiting earlier on today, and that's not just a nice to have. Uh, it's quite interesting about the number of people who really are nowhere near as productive as they should be, but for some of them in some places, having a trade union there to talk to in the first place can often help them rather than going up to their employer to acknowledge they don't have basic literacy or numeracy skills. Um, and what will actually help them to become more productive for their employer, not just that though of course, but in their wider life too. Business Wales helped create around 25,000 jobs since it was created and our development bank, the UK's first, has delivered about £1.2 billion pounds of positive impact in its first five years. So we have done some things right. Our challenge again, the scale and what more we can do. I think all of those uh, are essential to the future and examples of what we want to do and they've been harmed by the levelling up project and indeed the Internal Market Act. And for those of you who aren't political anoraks, that allows the UK government to make choices to spend money in devolved areas without needing to trouble themselves uh, with speaking to us about it. Now, we're not just £1.1 billion worse off by 2025. That's the cash loss before you think about the realities of inflation because of the refusal to meet pledges on EU funds. And Peter Foster from the Financial Times, um, not noted as a radical left winner of the Financial Times, although um, I think they were placed into the, um, the anti-growth coalition at that point for not um, slavishly agreeing with everything that was coming out from the six-week administration. Um, but he talked about slippery accounting from the Treasury on what's happening with those lost funds. And we talk a lot about this in Wales because the impact is greater here than other uh, UK regions, apart from perhaps Northern Ireland. You can see it in the charts that come about the impact on inequality here already. And it's also significant because in one place it signifies how far away the UK government has been from embracing devolution as part of the solution, creating a stronger version of our UK economy and what that means for people and 
communities. There's one particular line from the Stagnation Nation report, which I have had some sort of a look at it, um, and I actually checked this. Change on a scale required and needed is inconsistent with national politicians refusing to concentrate efforts or local politicians unable to embrace the disruption involved because they lack the powers to shape it. And I think that's national politicians in any of the parties that could form the UK government. It's a challenge for both of our major parties, not just one of them. And Andy Haldane, who, when he chaired the UK government's Industrial Strategy Council, he's now moved back uh, into government in one form. And it's interesting, I think his views might have shifted. But at that time, he said the best laid plans are those laid locally, which build a broad base of foundations, including investment, education, skills, and culture. That requires local institutions, requires them to have the holy trinity of powers, monies, and people. Both observations are correct, but in both cases, levelling up actually makes matters worse in the way it's operated in practice. The institutions are holding described, which would include the likes of Business Wales and the Development Bank, have been made worse off because powers and monies have been pulled back to the centre under the banner of the alert and they then redistributed in a much more scattered way. A levelling up plan worthy of credibility would have been published in 2020 with clear priorities designed to develop strong local economies in a more balanced UK economy and they could and should have been developed together with those local actors. Now I think it would also be described how it will be funded over multiple years and again this is one of the challenges with the current levelling up journey. It doesn't grab lots of headlines, but at the moment, the design is that every the levelling up funds as they are have to have an approved plan. Now, there's been some flux in the UK, so the plans haven't been approved yet, but the money has to be spent within each financial year. Now, previously with EU funds, people in this room will know you could move money over more than one year. This would mean that the money doesn't get spent and it goes back to the Treasury. I don't understand how a UK mission on levelling up can say, here's your money, but if you don't spend it, we'll have it back. That either means the Treasury does well and says it's not our fault, but those people in the provinces haven't spent the money, or it means money spent very poorly at the end of the year. And we have experience of people do that, to get money out the door so it isn't lost, and that can run contrary to what you're trying to do. I'd have thought that a government in need of some relatively pain-free wins could actually do something about making sure those budgets do have multi-year flexibility, because it will stop people investing in answers. Uh, and it's the same with multiply, which again is a UK government raid on, I suppose, a levelling up funds. They have an adult uh, numeracy program. Now, we have work to do on adult numeracy, that's true. But actually, we also have lots of work to do on adult literacy as well. And in choosing centrally, and this was Chancellor Sunak, as he then was, who decided to do this, it's taken that money away in an area where actually we could have spent the money better, I think. But also, who on earth is going to set up as, an, as a provider for a programme where you know you've got to spend the money within one year or lose it, and no certainty about what happens at the end of the three years when you can actually find the institution you set up no longer exists. So again, for those people wanting to deliver that provision, it doesn't provide the sort of multi-year certainty that should be required. Now, in Wales, uh, I think what we have done is we've gone through the intensive engagement with experts, we're in favour of experts broadly, uh, as well as devolved government, local government, business, universities, trade unions in the third sector. Uh, in conflict, global work was set an impossible task. We went through that because we did all that heavy lifting before we published our plan for replacement EU funds nearly two years ago, and we asked the OECD to help with its design and the entire process as we continue to work with them on what the future of regional policy should be within Wales. So it isn't simply a give all the money to Cardiff and we will decide for the rest of the country. It really is how we work alongside partners in regions. And we're still able to do some of that. So our local authorities are in regions. One of the few things we got out of levelling up was we persuaded the UK government not to have an alternative map that didn't map onto the regions we were working with. So there's some commonality there, which is sensible. We also have regional skills partnerships those people looking at skills together with businesses, together with providers to understand what skills should look like within that part of Wales. We've got some shared priorities. The challenge I think will be how all of those things add up or don't in the way those funds will then be spent and then all those people will come looking for money that doesn't exist. In our plans, we also had a role for the UK government and I think that's important to recognise. 
Well, we are part of the European Union, there was a European framework. But broad strategic objectives for health funds should be used, and we then determine things within that. So we did expect the UK would have a broad role in setting a strategic framework without then trying to make all of the individual choices or indeed without trying to bypass us all together. And I think there is still room to actually have a more sensible agreement where devolution is respected and we get to focus on the substance of what we want to do. If we had done that, two years into programmes, projects that we would have wanted to see happen would have had money being spent. The undeniable truth is that not a single penny of the shared prosperity fund has been spent in Wales or any other part of the UK to date, because there hasn't been any approval for it. And it does show an extraordinary level um, of not just muddled thinking, but the lack of the ability to actually make things work. So the chaos and the flux in government has very real consequences for how resources are used or not. Now our commitment is also to partnership work and social partnerships that we're proud of here in Wales, and it takes hard work. So working with businesses, working with local governments, working with higher education, and also working with trade unions. Um, and I think the former finance minister would recognise that at the start of the evolution, um, some of our civil servants thought that working with trade unions was just something for the Labour Party. Um, and it wasn't really something for the government to get involved in. But working with businesses was definitely government business. And we said actually, governments and trade unions are part of the social partnership co coalition we want to have to try to understand how we can best use our resources. In a small country like Wales, to try to get people into the same room to try to get some agreement on our path for the future. And that's definitely one of the things we should maximise in our journey forwards. And those forums do come together. They're essential in the pandemic, but I think what's coming, they're still going to find a real, a real purpose. Now, our commitment is, and it's not really rocket science, we want more jobs, better quality jobs, fair work that can also help to improve uh, people's well-being. Now, I do think in Wales that will continue to include manufacturing. I didn't read Christian's presentation as saying, forget manufacturing, it's never going to happen. There are many areas where we have significant manufacturing sectors. It's bigger in Wales uh, as a share of our economy than uh, other parts of the UK. And of course, we're a partner in government. Some of those sectors with global significance, from steel to semiconductors, been news recently, uh, to renewables and aerospace. Um, we have about 20% of Europe's and there's more to come, I think, within that sector. So those sectors and advanced manufacturing certainly has a future in Wales. We have other sectors of strength that do map into um, some of what Christian was talking about. So we have a burgeoning fintech sector here in Wales. Uh, significant interest in the growth uh, and international partners want to invest in that. Cyber security and TV and film. Um, the German ambassadors over recent, I don't know if just been polite when they looked at the uh, creative sector, but it's one of the things that there is more notice of than we have here in Wales. Uh, we're third only behind London and Manchester in the TV and film industry in the UK, which I think is all the more impressive. Impressive when you think that Manchester had a significant boost of the BBC located as well. Our approach is also focused on the everyday economy around us. We're trying to find a way to talk about the foundation economy that doesn't send people to sleep anymore in the world. But I think there's significant gain to be made from that. The way that we spend money locally, the way that we advantage local businesses that are rooted and grounded in their communities and aren't going to disappear somewhere else, is a strength to build on together with those areas of more significant financial investment that I've just been talking about. Now, a happier positive story of collaboration is, and I'll give you an example, so we, we're, we're not all um, having a down in the UK government. That's uh, Richard and one of our officers in the Welsh Government in the front row, and practically we work quite well with officers of the Department for International Trade, particularly in international settings where we have Welsh Government offices. We occasionally have uh, disagreements at a more senior level than with ministers, uh, but with Bayes as well, uh, we're making strong progress in the form of the Global Centre for Rail Excellence. Near the former mining town of Montloyne, it's a place made famous by the film Pride. And actually, the person in that film, David Donovan, I worked with him in his second career uh, as an organiser in Beckton. Uh, and I never knew it was him until I watched the film. I had many conversations with him. Um, but that joint investment is linking innovation with a global demand for a say just a niche industry, but a specialist industry, and it's well placed to deliver a good job where they're most needed. 
And it's a good example of one of the other things we need to do. And what does a just transition look like? As you move away from things that were significant employees in the past, how do you make sure you don't say to people, I'm sorry, you're no longer required? How do you make sure you keep those people in work and how to provide a different sort of future for them and their communities? So one of the things I say on a relatively regular basis is, as well as skills for the future, as well as our employability plan to try to bring people back to economically inactive, as well as thinking about what happens to children my son's age and older who are still in school, we need to recognise that the future of work is almost already here. In 10 years' time, the people in work, the great majority of them are already in the workplace. So part of what we still need to do is think about how we give people skills already in work to make sure they remain in work in their current job, as a job will change, or indeed in moving one industry to another. And that's one of the things I think we'll be able to do more of in the way we roll things like personal learning accounts here in Wales. Getting these users onto the table in an open and serious and sustainable way with the UKM is often not possible. I often end up having occasionally more serious conversations with UK ministers when the camera's not on and their uh, officials aren't in the room. But it is essential for us to do the job set out in the stagnation nation and actually make sure we do have a UK economy that works for the nations and regions that make it up and also a UK economy that's serious not just about growth but about tackling inequality. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Vaughan. Lots of food for thought then. Last but not least, Melanie, you are allowed to turn the slide off unless you want to speak to it. Shall I go and do that? the invitation to uh, talk here today, but more about prompting us to consider the issues that are raised in the report in the context of the Welsh economy. Thanks also for allowing us to be here at, at Swansea. Swansea is my hometown, so as someone that spends far too much time um, on the train to London, I do appreciate the kind of effort that goes into that, that commute. What I thought I'd try and do today is outline some of the areas where I agree with what's in the report provide some then hopefully constructive challenge about some of the areas where I think the report um, has perhaps potential limitations in the context of the Welsh economy and try then to look for the kind of um, solutions that we might do to kind of get the best of, of both worlds and I'll, I'll leave that very much to the audience to, to enhance. So, where I agree is in this long-term perspective, the need for um, a longer term strategy for the economy and um, whilst obviously policy analysis needs to consider the immediate, um, I think there is a risk of being distracted um, by the current kind of economic crisis, the kind of economic crisis that we're hit with and that we do then lose sight of the longer term objectives. That's really shown in the report how important the context is. So the fact that we're facing a cost of living crisis at this time when there's been a period of stagnation, austerity, um, previous economic crisis means we have less resilience to deal with it. And what we need to do is ensure resilience in the future by making sure we're on a, a longer term um, positive growth path. We have got some things to celebrate. So as has been mentioned, what we've seen is growth has improved in terms of employment. So what we've seen is more people gaining work, um, Wales converging on, on the UK in terms of employment. But as rightly identified, where we haven't seen the strength is in productivity. And what we're gonna need to do is to focus on that productivity if we are to raise living standards in the future. In relation to that, so clearly we want to look at the drivers of productivity, but for me, also, raising productivity and raising a a average living standards also helps tackle the additional challenge of inequality. So I think it's far easier when we've got an economy, um, sort of a rising tide lifts all boats, when we've got more resources to think about how we want to allocate them. The final comparative static exercise otherwise is that we've got limited resources and we're just looking to change um, individuals, so that means you've got to take off someone to give to someone else. If we've got a, more resources, I think it's much easier then to think about how we allocate those. It's not going to be the first time that anyone's talked about productivity in this room, and I think that illustrates how difficult the challenge is. We've been talking about it for some time. 
Wales has challenges, not least because the UK productivity has stagnated, so we've now got a gap between the UK and internationally, but also in terms of a, a kind of regional league table, Wales is down the bottom um, relative to the UK average. To the extent to which um, the comparative in the presentation between Wales and London were useful, I think it was really useful in highlighting for me what are the kind of core drivers of productivity. So human capital, anyone hear me speak before, education, skills, I would also include health in that as core drivers of individuals' own kind of economic prosperity but also of the broader macroeconomic prosperity. The other thing that was listed um, was kind of capital equipment for individuals. So the same individuals can be more productive if there's more um, equipment to use and thinking about the link then to that um, the lack of business investment in the UK relative to internationally. The third element that stands out always for an economist is agglomeration in economies. It's not discussed so much I think in um, other contexts but it's, it's the benefits for economies of scale being co-located. In that respect I think there is a useful um, information in terms of how we think about infrastructure, how we think about knowledge spillovers, how we think about sort of proximity to, to suppliers. But I do think that that analysis perhaps has limitations in, in the Welsh context. So when we look at that thought experiment and we try and think about in practice how might we implement the kind of growth that we were needed in, in Wales, then Clearly, that would mean that the UK would be thinking about investing in, in large second cities. And to me, as an economist, that makes sense because clearly there's, there's gains to be made in terms of agglomeration from that. But for me, as someone that lives at, um, in Swansea, is Cardiff, is Swansea really going to be one of those second cities that's invested in? The second element of that really is that that analysis focuses very much on productivity. It kind of neglects the um, potential downsides of some of that approach, not least how do we facilitate that in terms of housing, um, infrastructure, are there congestion, you know, the house price type of issues. So there are downsides of that kind of agglomeration approach. And I think then in some respects that focus on productivity in that extent does um, is distinct from some of the discussion that we had about sort of disposable income or, or potentially quality of life. In that context then you might think of okay if the UK is not going to necessarily be investing in um, Cardiff, Swansea, Welsh, Welsh cities then I have concerns about regional disparities that may arise of that and the fact that Wales may still be periphery and if the resources are invested elsewhere then that actually might exacerbate that regional disparities and you can think about exactly the same in the Welsh context so you may think okay the Welsh government have a role to invest in, in Cardiff in, in, in the um, Welsh context but you've got the same potential intra-regional disparities that are, are likely to emerge. So what would I take away from it? I would take away the fundamentals which is human capital, um, is an investment in physical capital and then try and work out how Wales can capitalise on what we know are agglomeration economies without necessarily facing some of those disadvantages. That's clearly a difficult challenge. I'm not saying I've got all the answers but there are clearly ways perhaps with digital infrastructure, with other forms of communication and transport links that might bring cities together they may allow us to develop the benefits of agglomeration more broadly to try and share those out. So things like, can we use remote working, home working to kind of have the benefits from agglomeration, but at the same time, don't create such spatial disparities. So I think the challenge for us is to ensure that we, we understand those drivers, but that we utilize them to fit into the Welsh context. Great. Great. The, um, now, at the beginning, I said that one of the things that means you have a strategy rather than having a kind of things you say, which is what most, most strategies, most things with the word strategy on them have no relationship to an actual strategy because they either a list of things someone's doing, have a look at the 
whereas the Scottish Government has tried to give you one example, or um, uh, they have no trade-offs, they have no sense of what you're trying to achieve, they don't give you any guidance to your decision. So one of the things, that's, one of the things within that is really important, which is what Melody's highlighting really well for us, is that if you have a strategy, it means you don't just say what you're going to try and achieve, you say why it's hard and what the downsides are. So why don't we just kick this off and then we're going to get to questions. Um, focus on the big one that sits within the framework of how we're coming up with the UK wine strategy, what, what, how it would affect Wales with the pros and the cons, which is what then is more sense getting at. So here's a simple version, which is we want UK productivity up. Okay, hopefully everyone agrees about that. Um, like one does, but most people do. Um, uh, for good reasons, because we think it raises wages and raises people's living standards. Okay. Secondly, we think a route to doing that is, is recognising that the UK is, is its uniqueness is about its service specialisation. It's not that it doesn't have, as you say, lots of really good manufacturing sectors, but they're small relative to most other countries in terms of export gets exported. Okay, they um, are like I mean, and the gap is large. Like we're very unusually specialised in services, and it's not just financial services; it's basically all services, right? So it's like intellectual property cultural things, uh, universities, they have now. So here's where it gets hard. Then we say, right, we need to do more of that well. That activity happens in larger cities, generally, there are more people close to larger cities. So then we say, we can't do that well in London because capacity constraints are really big. So we've got to grow a range of second cities around the United Kingdom. Right? That's, like, that's Cardiff, that's Birmingham, that's Manchester, that's Leeds, pick your, you can put the list in the order you find most appealing to you. If we did that, it would reduce regional, in, regional inequality within the United Kingdom. You'd have lower income and productivity gaps between the regions and nations of the UK. But, this is what I'm going to come to you to give some warning, uh, but you would probably have higher inequality within those regions. Yeah? Because that's called a trade off. Right. I think you, should, you can tell yourself you're going to do everything to minimise that. You're going to build the houses where they're needed so that you don't get house prices pushing up and pushing down uh, people's living standards in the places where you're going to build a successful economy. And you'll tell yourself that you'll connect the entire region really well, so there'll be none of that. But history says you are unlikely to be a complete brilliant government, so you'll probably won't get it all right. So probably inequality will go up within the, within the region, even though it will come down within the United Kingdom. Is that a good or a bad idea? I think it's one of the things we've actually had to grapple with previously, actually. So, there's a bit of a phrase in parts of Wales where if you ask where an investment should go, the answer is ABC, anywhere but Cardiff. Uh, and there is a problem with that. I think that some of that is about the way people work together or don't. Um, and so you always get some of that and that those relationships do go into how choices are made. But actually, the problem is that Cardiff is too wealthy compared to the rest of Wales. It's actually the car compared to the rest of the UK is only average. So it isn't a high, high wage um, city. And actually when I look at my part of the city that I represent in Cardiff, actually the southern half of Cardiff is really poor. If the southern, if the southern part of the city of Cardiff was a local authority, it would be bigger than Merthyr Tidville and it would be poorer. Um, whereas the town of Penarth where I live is a lovely middle class town. Um, you know, actually relatively high income. So our challenge is both what we do to advantage Cardiff, uh, to help it to grow, and what we do to make sure Cardiff isn't left on its own. If the question was, do you think we should grow Cardiff and forget about the rest of us, the answer was we know. I'm not saying that's what you said. Yeah. But I recognise there are trade-offs of where will people go, and it's one of the things we are trying to do. Uh, we had um, Jonathan Paul just do some work for us to look at our budget and priorities. And there's a positive point about the fact that there are opportunities in Cardiff but in other parts of the world too. If you compare that to other parts of the UK, property values are lower, both for people who want to buy houses, they're lower for businesses that want to invest, and our challenge is whether we can get the right level of skills into the economy so people possibly want to come here. There's also a post-pandemic opportunity for people that might want some other quality of life for us to offer. Look at Swansea as a city. You've got uh, a coastline here. Cardiff doesn't have a beach like Swansea does. You've got an opportunity to do things and live here and if you can work remotely for some of your week rather than having to get on a train to a much larger city all the time, then actually there are people that want that trade-off in quality of life terms as well. And 
part of our challenge is how far can we do that and what can we do to make sure that it's part of what I think Rob Stewart was talking about. I'm um, being honest because there aren't lots of Swansea representatives annoying the room, but I think that 20 years ago, Swansea wanted to be Cardiff and was annoyed that it couldn't be and that there was a tension going on in Cardiff. I think there was political stability in the city of Cardiff and that allowed the leader to do some things that were unpopular. Um, we won't go into a dissection of that particular person. But actually, I think Swansea in the last decade has been much better at saying, what can we do in Swansea that is more unique and is for Swansea and isn't simply trying to say, we can be the same as Cardiff and everything is doing. And so that, I think, is part of our challenge. What will work best in different parts of it? It's like saying, you can't recreate the advanced manufacturing aerospace cluster that exists in North East Wales. It's a really significant plus and it draws people in a big travel to work area right from Anglesey and into England. I think that's part of the challenge. How can you have speciality where you can have real economic growth and higher wages and how can you ensure people can get to and from that in a vision that doesn't simply say to people, your future is to be a dormitory town for Cardiff. Um, that won't work. Okay, very good. So unless, unless they're a total false binary, if you could have a bit, bit richer, but it would mean higher inequality. Good idea. You can't make me answer that. So uh, it, that's when you get a strategy. Clearly a trade, no, a strategy. It, it's clearly a trade-off. You have to have some national elements to it, which mean that you have benefits nationally, but recognising that there are these trade-offs and that you, if, if you're going to invest, you will get greater return for it in, in, in an urban area, in a large urban area. But I think that really what I said about thinking about the connectivity and how other places benefit from the growth of Cardiff or Swansea is the way to make sure that we don't have to take that binary, that binary choice. Right, let's get some questions and if you want to answer the question, because no one on the panel did because it's too hard. Uh, um, I'm going to ask everyone this question whenever I go and do anything outside London, which is like, do you want, the, how much do you want the higher growth? How much, and are, do you want the trade-offs? And you can minimise them, building lots of houses, transport, but they are real. And if you don't know, then you won't get to this question. Right, who wants to go first? You can give us the answer or a question. Come on, I don't mean none of you. you some people will be writing books on the answer. Come on. Let's give us a question at the back. Thank you. Um, well, as Vaughan has mentioned, mentioned me indirectly <laughs> twice to, this evening, I suppose I want to respond. I, I thought Melanie's challenge, and can I first of all thank you, Torsten, for this event um, and, it, and the work you've done on the, uh, the Resolution Foundation. Um, it's good to have a leading think tank which is very transparent about its funding as well. If anyone wishes to donate, I'll be transparent about that too. <laughs> Take cash checks. Sorry. Um, yes, I was finance minister, but I was economic development minister for five years as well. Um, I, I, I don't think this issue around, I, I'm not sure it's such a binary choice, but you can, have, you can have economic growth and productivity. And no one has actually mentioned anything to do with climate change or the challenges and the critique of. Uh, growth uh, that that brings. Um, so, I, I, or, or because Britain, it's not just a huge regional contract inequality which has been well attested. It's the huge sub-regional inequalities, and, and Wales particularly. And, and it isn't. I don't think it could just be dismissed as anything but Cardiff. Uh, I represented this constituency for t um, 11, 12 years in the was then the National Assembly. Uh, and one of the reasons why two-thirds of Wales qualified for European aid and, and was able to apply um, abrogation or derogation of state aids was because of those huge inequalities. Um, the danger is that those inequalities are growing. Um, Vaughan mentioned several of the sectors. He mentioned uh, semiconductors, he mentioned Creative Industries, and I established a Creative Industries strategy when I mentioned that. Um, if you look at where those jobs are, they're almost exclusively in Cardiff and South East Wales. So those are high productivity jobs. Um, I know the leader of the council is not here this evening, and yes, there has been a big investment locally, not least in the city do. But if you look at where that investment's gone, 
for example, the arena next to this building. And it's a very laudable achievement, but entertainment and hospitality are low productivity, low value added sectors. So while there's a boost in terms of construction, and you'll see lots of development in Swansea, now a huge amount of that is student accommodation. Most of that is developed by property companies, private equity companies, many of them global. The, the, the jobs will be low paid that come from that. And the contribution to the local economy will, will be fairly minimal because most of that profit, most of that income will leave the city. And that's my concern is that, and you, you meant, uh, and your colleague um, Krishna showed that, in the productivity variation of the amounts of Cardiff and Paris came out. But it's a huge contrast uh, between Cardiff and South East Wales and the rest of West Wales. Similarly in North Wales, the contrast between the D side area, particularly around Airbus and North West Wales. So I don't think these issues can be dismissed because politically they're going to be big, increasingly big ones. The other thing I'd say is hardly anybody's mentioned education and skills. It's interesting, before devolution in 1999, most of the contrast was with Ireland. That has virtually disappeared. Since devolution, it's all been about Scotland, largely, which I think around the chimera of powers. And I think, well, I won't go to that, so another big, big political issue. If you I go to Ireland like I do, it's incredible to see the difference in that country over 30, 40 years. Lots of reasons for that, but one of them was a very clear sectoral approach around the economy, a few key sectors, yep. but relentless focus on education and training, particularly around the FE skills level. Um, and you can see that now with the OECD PISA report. Ireland regularly comes near the top. Now, I know there's critique of PISA, but nevertheless, I think it's a valid, yep. one valid indicator. Uh, and I know Wales has done better recently, but it's still a problem. But the other thing about Ireland was not only it performs well on literacy, numeracy and science, but the gap between the least and the most disadvantaged pupils is one of the narrowest. And I think one of the dangers here, but you may have seen the report came out earlier this year from the Educational Policy Institute, which showed that educational disadvantage had hardly narrowed in the last 10 years in England and Wales, and in fact Wales had performed less worse than England. Now, if we're not able to crack that, then to a large extent, we're really going to struggle about improving productivity. Brent, look, loads of um, uh, thought, food for thought in there. Northern Irish win for even bigger gaps between uh, things. Let's take a question from here, and then we'll go back to the panel, and then we'll give these people for a minute. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, mate. Can we hear you? Yeah, I'm Laura. This is my first uh, visit to one of these events. Um, so I'm a strategy manager for Imperial Tobacco in Bristol. Um, some of the things you've said tonight are uh, very relatable. So I'm actually from Northern the Tap in the Valleys. Um, and one of the things I'm struggling with is I live in the country, like work here, and what's happened with COVID has meant that I can actually work from home. Um, this is something we talk about with my friends is that there is a brain drain on Wales. Essentially, if I want a good job and work within strategy, I can't get that job in Wales currently. I, I need to go to Bristol, I've worked in Nottingham, I've worked for well, Aldermen, wherever. Um, now, there's some great businesses in Wales, Tiny Rebel, uh, one of them, Pendering, uh, that I'd love to be a strategy manager for. Unfortunately, salaries don't reflect the same as they do in other companies. Um, and one of the things uh, from my personal experience that I've recognised is during all this cost of living crisis, my salary hasn't actually increased in line with inflation. My, I work for a global company. And the reason being potentially is because of the shareholders. And this company is answerable to the shareholders. Now, how can, with these global companies that have a big investment within the UK, provide a lot of jobs for people, how can they be held to account to help with this inflation issue and with the pay? Because you know, I'm probably classed as a middle class earner, potentially. Um, and that's kind of one of the immediate issues I'm seeing for myself um, within pay. And the second one is being within the NHS. Now, being from the Valleys, it's one of the poorest areas um, 
in the UK, having you know, having gone through personal experience currently, my dad had a heart attack, having to wait three hours whilst he was having a heart attack within the NHS, within the hospital, all I care about is the nurses, the doctors, the porters get an investment in terms of um, their pay. And now they have to strike in order to get that. Now, I'm just wondering where the link between the UK, the Welsh economy, links in with the NHS, because ultimately, I care about health. Health of people, health of my family, health of myself. Unfortunately, I can't afford private, neither can my family. Um, and I just, whilst I understand this is a, you know, a strategy for uh, you know, the next eight years, is it a strategy for the next six months? Um, and I'm really working on that. Great, great question. We definitely haven't got a strategy for the NHS for the next six months, because that's a very hard job. The, um, right, Ellie, anyway, why don't you kick us off? There's loads of there. I mean, um, uh, we had education skills, we had, why can't I get a good job in Wales? Yeah, so, so many different things, but I think education skills and health has always been, and as long as I've been doing this job, it's the thing that I personally think is, is critical to Wales. What we've seen is gaps in education, gaps in health, and we know at an individual level, health education is key for your own earnings, and it's, it's key for the border. I entirely agree with you. You need to start intervention young. It's early years for me. It's sort of that intergenerational transmission, and it's too late by the time we're talking about skills amongst the population. So personally, I'd be investing in the much longer time frame. Obviously, I'm not a policy maker, so it's much easier for me to say that. But that's what I do, and I think that's where we can get the higher return. In terms of kind of living in Wales and potentially getting those jobs, I still believe, even though sort of remote working has declined relative to uh, pandemic time, I still think there are opportunities for Wales now just because it's peripheral in nature to take more advantage of that. So people will be able to live in Wales more, benefit from all the sort of quality of life, um, lower housing pricing, but still get some of those high paid um, jobs. So I think there are ways that we can get those agglomerations through remote working. Okay. Christian, why don't you uh, touch on some of those and then I'll come to Vaughan for last words. Um, yeah, so I think sort of maybe framing it in terms of the trade-off you were speaking about before. I think a lot of what's now been said sort of points towards the importance here of delivering that growth, but also connecting it to regions by transport, but also connecting uh, people from more disadvantaged backgrounds to these opportunities via education, um, sort of ensuring that the education system provides people with the skills they need to, to, to achieve um, and to, to reach uh, sort of the high pay and high productivity roles, but also to then work on improving conditions and pay in these non-tradable sectors, um, which might not be as productive, such as in retail, but where sort of labour laws um, and regulation within this country can do significant things to sort of improve dig dignity in these types of jobs um, and ensure that they have security um, and pay stability while doing so. So I think all that's been pointed towards is sort of the way in which we ensure that some of these trade-offs are mitigated, but also while there might be increases in inequality as a result, um, there are ways in which, sort of over time, by enabling access to opportunity, um, some of some of this dynamically sort of reduces. Thank you. Um, I think on the point about how you're going to pay rise, what happens in the firm you work for, there's a big challenge for us about the way in which. Our economy works at other parts, you know, think about the US economy as well, and you find real unevenness in culture. So some people are driven by shareholder value, and that's where the profit goes. And there's enough profit that goes into keeping workers there as opposed to um, a different version. And you see this in the UK, US, and other economies as well, where they have a different bargain uh, on how sustainable they want their employment to be, the term conditions they offer, the expectations around how profit is used, and what goes out of the company as well. And that sort of extractive model uh, is one that we have real challenges. You see it in the care sector, actually. We talked a bit about that earlier. The care sector is very driven, um, in large part, by people extracting profit. Not every part of the care sector. You do see not-for-profit organisations that reinvest their profit, uh, but it's part of the real unevenness. It's part of the reason why we have had to do some work in introducing the real living wage into the care sector is that people who do a really important job uh, are being completely squeezed, so there's had to be something done to make sure that doesn't happen. And so it's no surprise that's a sector that struggles to keep hold of people, 
particularly when the economy recovers, you find people leaving that sector who go into work in supermarkets and other places. So you know, there's a real challenge, and, but the model doesn't just apply to smaller businesses, uh, it applies to larger ones too, and I understand the point you're making. Now, on the health burden, I think this is quite important, I know that uh, Melanie mentioned this as well, when I was the health minister, I was always interested in the future of the economy because I understood that where people were relatively um, better off, health outcomes were better. So, and you know, it's, it's not a secret. Health outcomes and economic outcomes map over each other, greater problems in one, greater problems in the other. Uh, and for me, that also is part of the reason for our economic activity and inactivity rates. People's health burden, if they're still in work, they're less likely to be productive. And part of the reason why lots of people are out of work and economically inactive is their health. And you see, that's actually got worse, actually, since COVID. It's hard to understand really how much COVID has, has to play, but it's definitely got worse uh, in that sense as well. And the problem is we've lost lots of people at the older end of the workforce and often people lots of skills and institutional memories, so we've got a big challenge in every sector too as well. Um, but I think that when you think about the health and the opportunities to do something about it, that's what our employability plan was trying to set out. Investing in people's health is an investment in their economic activity and it's about our constant challenge around to improve people's health literacy. Not to help me and the government, but actually to help themselves, to help their community think actually, if you have better health outcomes, you'll be more productive, you're more likely to live longer and crucially to have to live well for longer as well. Now, and on the, I guess it leads into spawns here, look, I'm, it's a, it's a bit of a character to say anyway, not ever quite a few way, but it's a sentiment that I think has received it. Um, and that's partly because I think Cardiff is both more cooperative with its regional partners in South East Wales uh, than it might have been in the past. It's also, I think, partly because um, of the different mission that other people are looking at and taking. And as well as the points you make about hospitality and leisure services and opportunities to do that in this area, there is also, and you'll be aware of this, some of your your time as a health board chair, there are um, resources in not just health but in the life sciences sector around that. You know, Pfizer chose to come to Swansea instead of other parts of the UK, and Jeremy Hunt as a health minister, as a health secretary, actually asked Pfizer why they'd chosen to come to Swansea. And it was because of the way we set up, because there are opportunities, there's more to do, I think, in life sciences and taking advantage of the way we organise the health and there to be a real plus for people in the life sciences sector. So I do think Swansea recognise that it needs some, uh, some higher productivity and high wage areas too uh, as part of what it is. Now don't go back to skills. Uh, and skills being crucial to an economy. Don't disagree with investing in early years. We've shifted more of our investment into early years. The challenge is how much more can we do and talk to spot the trade-offs. Putting more and more money in, we've expanded our childcare offer. Again, we want to do more to expand the childcare offer to make it affordable for people, but it's how fast we can go that is the real challenge. The same with skills. You know, I'm, I didn't really ask for skills to come with the economy portfolio. It doesn't all the time because it's one of the big things we can do uh, to improve prospects for the future. And our challenge will be maintaining and keeping investment in that sector, including the point where make sure people don't close off activities in themselves by the times they're 14, 15, and they've not actively chosen not to do things, but it's no longer an option for them, as well as what we then do in post-16 as well. So. It's easy to talk about what's the right outcome I want people to do, and the challenge is getting people there and taking everyone with you. So education and skills certainly key to our future. Great, thank you very much indeed. Now, we said it's all about trade-offs, so you've got a choice. You can have a drink, or you can go to the fun fair. That is basically the choice you face when you can go home, prepare for the football. But can we, before you do that, can you thank our speakers for the effort they've made today? <laughs> Thank you all for coming on a cold wet night, it's very much appreciated and thank you for all your thoughts and hopefully we'll get to have a chat later and if you don't drop us an email with the answer if you found it. Okay, have a good night everyone.